I am Richard Stone from Dana-Farber in Boston, and I'm fortunate to be joined by Dr. Ivana Goyo, Goyo from uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and Dr. Uh, Marion Subcleve from LMU in Munich. And uh, we heard today at the uh, IWAL session uh, some very interesting data about the, using immunotherapy in both acute myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoid leukemia. Uh, so I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Goyo. Uh, t tell me what where you think the field is right now in immunotherapy for AML, checkpoint inhibitors, the like. So I think that the uh, field is moving forward. I think the problem is with many novel therapies that have been developed, you know, that might slow down a little bit development of checkpoint inhibitors because many studies that are currently underway will probably require its own repeat in combination with an etoclax of some novel drugs. Um, Again, uh, I think that there is a role for checkpoint inhibition in acute myeloid and lymphoid leukemia, and I think as more we learn uh, in preclinical data that we will be able hopefully to more successfully incorporate it with transplant, with bite antibodies, and everything else. Well, right now, would you say that uh, off outside the research setting should checkpoint inhibitors be used in AML or ALL at this point in time? I, I don't think that outside of the research setting we have sufficient data, although I'm, I'm, I would challenge myself, let's say, in patients who have extra medullary relapses, would you potentially consider using ipilimumab or similar? I think we need more data, and so. Now, you've done some very interesting work with checkpoint inhibition and ALL. Could you go over the preclinical rationale and what you're doing now in, in that field? So I think that uh, with use of bite antibodies uh, in ALL, we have more experience. We have less in acute myeloid leukemia, but it's just part of activation of T cell is associated with upregulation of multiple co-inhibitory receptors, including PD-1. And the reason why we went in that direction was because re responses to blinatumab are great. But the issue is that they are not that durable. I mean, there's, let's separate from minimal residual disease. And also what is striking for me from initial studies of blinatumumab, you couldn't really detect even difference with the transplant. And so, you know, how we can improve this outcome, how we can get uh, deeper responses and, um, and whether this activation of adaptive resistance, can it be overcome in combination with checkpoint inhibitors? You're doing a, an interesting study now with blinatumumab and trying to magnify the ability to activate the T cells by using New volume map, and then you'll add uh, ipilimumab to that. So that's a very interesting study. Now, Dr. Sikpleva, you've you've uh, done a lot of work in immunotherapy as well, in uh, particularly in AML, and we talked about using checkpoint inhibitors to enhance the T cell ability of T cells to kill. What about being able to present antigens to the immune system in a novel way? You've done some very interesting work using dendritic cells. Could you explain that to us briefly? Yeah, so I think the challenge in AML is the target antigen that applies to the car and bite, um, as well as to intracellular presented uh, target antigens. And I think if we look at the bone marrow, and, and there's very interesting data on the uh, T cell compartment, we see we don't have a very strong T cell response. So I think vaccine strategies, and that was what I presented today, um, are. Um, platform to induce T cell responses that, that might be then augmented by other strategies like checkpoint inhibitors or hypomethylating agents. So um, what we've done at our center, we've done a dendritic cell trial, so we've done a lot of work in optimizing a protocol to generate dendritic cells from monocytes, from AML patients, and then upload these with several leukemia-associated antigens, and then do a vaccination strategy in the post-remission setting, where we were able to induce strong immune responses. How do you decide what antigens to present? I mean, uh, one approach that's been taken, as you know, is to just take the tumor cell and fuse it with a dendritic cell, uh, which then obviates the need to know anything about the antigens. Right, so I, I think that's a, a very difficult question to answer. Nobody has the perfect answer. So we decided to go for defined antigen, WT1 and PRAME, for two reasons. First of all, they are overexpressed in the majority of AML patients. And we also thought if we identify and use defined antigens, um, it's 
a better tool also for immune monitoring so that we actually uh, can detect what we are doing. So the challenge is if you use AML lysate, which is attractive, we are just using uh, antigens you don't have to define. The detection and learning from the vaccine strategy is more difficult as you don't know what you are actually inducing. Now you had a very nice uh, summary using the algorithm NICE. Could you explain what that meant in terms of augmenting the vaccine strategy? Right, so I, I like to make a case that um, also in immunotherapy, you are not going with one strategy, like in conventional chemotherapy and even seven plus three in metasterine or something, you're using combinations. So I think also in the immunotherapy uh, field, we need to go for immunotherapy combinations. So I suggested NICE for using neoepitopes. So these are uh, hopefully um, neoepitopes antigens derived uh, preferentially from oncogenes, so we have uh, less of a problem of antigen escape. Um, we use checkpoint inhibition to augment these induced T cell responses, then use a vaccine like a dendritic cell vaccine um, together with hypomethylating agents, which have shown to have a positive influence on the T cell compartment, but also on um, expression of leukemia associated antigen and on the MHC12 machinery of the cells. So I think nice um, combining these strategies might be a way to go, and it's more complicated than just the vaccine, but I think that's the way so it is. So going forward, how much of that, those components need to be developed before you'd want to do a randomized trial against the standard of care? And these settings, which is observation. Right, so we're going to initiate a trial together with MD Anderson where we're going to do double checkpoint with hypomethylating agent. Um, different to the trials that are currently already running, we are using a LUX3 um, antibody, which in our preclinical work has to been shown to be highly relevant as a negative immune checkpoint inhibitory. And we are currently developing a vaccine strategy that is targeting dendritic cells in vivo that are then presenting neoepitopes. So we're going to do this combination trial and then in the next step, combine it with a vaccine um, that is linked to a near epitope. Absolutely good. And uh, Dr. Goyo, do you want to say something about using blintumab in the post-transplant setting, which is also very interesting. We know that it works as an MRD eraser, shown by Dr. Gokby get quite elegantly. Uh, what about how would we fit it into the post-transplant setting in ALL? So I, I think the major problem with post-transplant setting is that when we react to the relapses too early, so the question is when do we, when do we intervene? And I think that worse outcome in post-transplant setting are in patients who relapse early post-transplant and generally once you are behind one year, your chance of durable remission is significantly increased. So because this is leukemia meeting, I think there is a lot of concern about transplant-related mortality. Maybe I benefited from the fact that I am at Hopkins and we use post-transplant cyclophosphamide platform, which is associated even in large study with significantly reduced transplant-related mortality, probably at the rate 15% or less, and in our own institution rates are probably around 5 to 7% or less. So that allows us really that we early on can intervene. We don't have much toxicity. We have reduced intensity conditioning, and we can stop immune suppression early. So that kind of shifts the attention from the toxicity of the transplant to the relapse, which actually in all the studies is showing the, to be the major cause of that. So by post-transplant brina, we hope that early intervention will eventually delay relapse and potentially improve relapse-free survival in these patients. And then, you know, from the science standpoint, um, I think there's some elegant data on HLA down regulation and PD-1 up regulation as alternative mechanism of leukemia relapse. And it is possible that with blinatumumab, which we are going to examine in correlative studies, that we are actually maybe upregulating some of this HLA expression to, to interferon gamma secretion and so on. So study is exciting. We did pilot data and nobody relapsed so far. It's a short follow-up. Uh, toxicity is pretty much none, no GVHD exacerbation. That's exciting. Now, just to finish up, I'd like you to each think quickly about what you'll be talking about next year. What will be the key thing that's going to happen in the next year that's going to cause you to talk about it? So I think the future is going to be combining uh, molecular diagnostics and technology with immunotherapy. So I, I clearly think 
um, team work in immunotherapy partners, but also in diagnostics, um, trying to identify maybe more individualized um, mm -hmm. target antigens might be a way to go and then elicit um, immunotherapy through maybe a more individualized approach, depending, for example, on the biomarkers that have been identified uh, for patients maybe with a higher T cell infiltrate in the bone marrow, looking at the genetics, and then picking um, the suitable immunotherapy. As don't know if it's actually going to be next year, but hopefully in two <laughs> well, years like or something. Year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think it would be key, but specifically talking about checkpoint inhibitors and immune intervention, I think it's key. Is going to I think actually two things. One thing that I'm really excited about is one to really can we decipher based on these T cell infiltrates in the bone marrow or not which immune intervention would be more appropriate for individual patient. And then second thing, um, I think many studies are done, but what I'm really excited also to learn mechanism of resistance and relapse, as we already mentioned, we, we have excellent responses in combination with checkpoint inhibitor and blinatumumab, but yet we do still see extra medullary relapses. So can that be overcome with dual inhibition? What other intervention we need to do? So I think that's also the way how we are going to learn more how to implement some of immune intervention up front. So I'm really excited about that for next year. It's very exciting. Well, we've heard a lot about personalized therapy for the mutations that occur in these leukemias. Personalized immunotherapy offers a really special way to perhaps make a big dent in these diseases. So thank you both very much for these excellent comments and we look forward to a great year of productivity in the lab and in the clinic.